Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Mistreatments and Miracles, stories from 1920s Alabama. My name is Emma Bailey, and I'm a double major in English and History at the University of Montevallo. My name is Grace Powell. I'm an environmental science major at the University of Montevallo. Today, we're going to be talking about the serial axe murders that raged through Birmingham, Alabama in the 1920s, or as I like to call it, the slashings in the South. So we're going to talk about how these uh, crimes reflect social and political prejudices and gross abuses of power of the era, and how the investigations were largely powered by racial profiling and contaminated evidence. So it's Birmingham, Alabama in the 1920s. Can you set the scene for us? So Birmingham boomed in the early 1900s, having all of the resources to make a new economic powerhouse, steel. The new era's flashiness, economic prosperity, and social open-mindedness promised opportunities, so people flocked from rural farms to the city. Birmingham quickly quadrupled in size over the span of 30 years. The blessing of industrial power and New Age money encouraged people to leave behind the agrarian status quo of sharecropping, plantations, and money crops. However, despite this, even within the wonders of electricity and the excitement of economic riches, the historical injustices of the state could not be escaped and the tensions of the city came to light under the swing of an axe. So what were the axe murders all about? The social and political prejudices of Birmingham gave motive and shape to the bloody 1920s Birmingham axe murders. So, let me set the stage for you. On the night of March 5th, 1921, an unknown assailant struck store owner C.C. Pipkins with an axe while robbing his Birmingham storefront. He survives initially because of an onlooker stumbling onto the scene and chasing off the assailants. But Pipkins never recovers consciousness for questioning by the police, and he dies two days later in the hospital. Now, would you say the actions during this robbery were overkill? Yeah, I think it was a little bit of overkill to kill Pipkins, definitely. Basically, the onlooker, he was an unclaimed, like, individual, like he never named himself. He claimed to watch two black assailants flee the scene of the attack. But obviously Pipkins was unable to comment because he was hospitalized and then dead because of the overkill that you mentioned. (laughs) Yes, yes. Um, So the attack on Pipkins marks basically the beginning of a spree of terror made up of 44 crimes in Birmingham from 1921 to 1929. That's a lot, I know. So they're all connected by a similar attack pattern, similar victims, and a shared murder weapon. Um, And so they garnered the monomer, the Birmingham Axe Murders. And did they all share a motive? Oh, yeah. So, basically, there were two sprees. First, let's talk about the first one. The first spree lasted from 1921 to 1924 and targeted a demographic of mainly immigrants and shop owners. The number of victims reported fluctuates between 15 to 24 deaths, but modern scholars like Jeremy Gray have found the number to be closer to 18 total deaths and 16 total injuries. Essentially, the racist social culture and highly competitive economic state of the 1920s Birmingham um, formed a perfect environment for the first spree. So it started with Pickens and ended 26 attacks later in 1924 with Edwin Sparks. Basically, Birmingham had been marred by a history of racism and anti-immigration sentiments. Alabama social groups formed an intense usher them mentality. Birmingham, the most populous city in Alabama in the 1920s, forced a collision between different sociocultural groups, namely African Americans, European immigrants, and long-term white residents of the South. Birmingham, because it became a hot spot for immigration because of its economic pros- prosperity. Of prosperity, thank you. Um, people flocked there for good fortune, but instead, this new influx of economic competition and collision of cultures made discrimination rise drastically, and that gave rise to the first axe murder spree. Although robbery is the officially stated motive, it hardly covers the full extent of the crime spree and the weight of the crimes committed. Immigrants were targeted for their economic competition, essentially. And how did the public respond to all of this? The community's response to the murders really further reflect a fear of the, the problems, but also like a little bit of desire and excitement. In 1922, the social outrage began. The press, which had become a business plagued by yellow journalism and a hunger for profit, latched onto the murders with a fiercely sensational spin. The articles focused on the bloodiness and the rage and the awful parts of it and really sensationalized it. 
and this kind of earned the crimes many monomers by various newspapers, such as the infamous Birmingham Axe Murders, the attacks of the Birmingham Axe Syndicate, and the attacks of Henry the Hacker. Like Jack the Ripper. Like Jack the Ripper, exactly. Um, Henry the Hacker was a black-coated um, drawing, essentially, of like what these people imagined the murder to look like and be like, and was widely published. So in response to this outrage and fear, the Ku Klux Klan actually marched in Avondale, which is a Birmingham neighborhood, to kind of claim their territory and to intimidate the murderers, which is not particularly effective, believe it or not, and probably caused more problems than it helped. How was the investigation conducted? So this public outcry um, kind of pushed the police department into overdrive. The investigation of the crimes by the Birmingham Police Department suffered from a lack of operational crime scene technology. Without modern DNA testing and surveillance technology, the police department depended intensely on rudimentary clues, eyewitness <laughs> accounts, and experimental technology. Some Sherlock Holmes type Exactly. Um, so the most important aspect were the eyewitness accounts. In particular, the eyewitness account of the initial attack on C.C. Pipkins greatly influenced the course of the investigation. Essentially, every eyewitness account after that, that was successfully conducted, um, seemed to revolve around two black men. Um, the problem with that is that that was publicized, so it's very easy for humans to assume that they see things, even if they don't. So it takes a lot of the water, like it takes a lot of water out of the bucket. It also, a lot of the victims and victims' families refused to testify because there's a lot of distrust in the police department. Because the Ku Klux Klan championed a really popular base in Birmingham, they claimed a lot of control over the social and political hierarchy, including the police department, unfortunately. So because of a lack of clues and a lack of viable leads, the police department really leaned heavily upon the anti-black sentiments. Mm -hmm. There were a lot of leading questions said to like eyewitnesses, like, did you see black people? Kind of like that kind of leading into it. And so that was not good. And they even went into very bad interrogations using experimental technology. What kind of experimental technology? Have you heard of truth serum? I've heard of it. I didn't know it was real. <laughs> so truth serum in the 1920s, it's a mixture of scopolamine, which is a medicine for pregnant women traditionally, um, for anti-nausea, and also um, a blend of morphine. Basically, um, this guy, his name was Dr. House in the early 1900s, he gave scopolamine to people for medicinal uses, but he found that people dosed with the drug maintained no imagination and therefore had no power to think or reason. So obviously, because it's the 1920s, he begun he begins experimenting on criminals and prisoners in New Orleans with this. Because nobody cares about crim criminals and prisoners in New Orleans. Exactly, of course not. Right. <laughs> not in this time. And he immediately begins releasing his non-peer-reviewed findings to the newspapers. Lovely. They take it and they run with it, baby. And that becomes the advent of the truth serum. So this is why the, it led to its use on the suspects of the Birmingham Axe murders. There were other people convicted, but the police were mainly after who they considered the ringleaders of the Axe Syndicate. One day, a young woman, Mary Frances Sanders, testified that she was part of a group which had targeted a mixed race couple and allegedly and assumedly all other like actual immigrants and other victims. According to her account, a group of 10 people were drinking, and someone suggested they go sculling, which basically means bumping people over the head and robbing them. She identified Peyton Futz Johnson and Odell and Pearl Jackson, and supposedly they bragged about a bunch of people's murders. Um, and so upon this, they were like, boys, the police department, boys, we got them. They go and they arrest these three people. Now, all of these were done under the influence of the truth serum. Um, Sanders was not, mm. but these three are the people that get the, the truth serum. Okay. It's injected into their back, and they essentially were interrogated using this highly experimental and um, now unconstitutional drug. Here. And 
Basically, the use of scopolamine on interrogies and especially on solely black suspects in this investigation really represents the problems of the time. Is there was a preference for upholding the status quo more than like actually finding the murderers. Scopolamine as a truth serum has remained questionable even to this day, and back then it was even known that it wasn't really accurate because in New Orleans, under Dr. House's recommendation, um, they wrongly convicted a person of murdering somebody who was still alive and found still alive like a week later. Because it really depends on like your perception. During the interrogations of Pearl and Odell and Foots Johnson, they would have these like they would have these breaks essentially, and they would tell them, "Oh, you can go get water," and then they'd say, "Hey, did you get water?" And basically, they would have hallucinated getting water. They say, "Of course, I got water." Right off the bat, that's incorrect. That's not. That's <laughs> so. Rather than a truth serum, it was more of a hallucinogenic. Yeah, kind of. It just depends entirely on your human perception. Um, and then in 1923, the three are convicted off of the truth serum. Allegedly, the judge did not allow it to be a piece of evidence for the court. But the problem was that people still heard it. It was still mentioned in the court, yeah. despite that. So it's kind of like officially it's not, but it is. Forget that part. <laughs> yeah. In 1925, they had been sentenced to death by hanging. At least Pearl and Odell were, but it was stopped the day before by Governor William Brandon on account of the fact they were uh, prosecuted on accounts of truth serum. Good for him. Good for him. Is that it? So they catch the ringleaders. They're all imprisoned. Is that it? No, of course not. Spree two. Of course not. It's even more racially motivated somehow. Oh, yay. It targets interracial couples, and there's a whole bunch of copycat murderers. And on top of that, it is greatly ignored by officials. In 1926, in an interview about the continued high murder rate in Birmingham, Alabama, Jefferson County solicitor Jim Davis said, Two years ago, we convicted three ends of these crimes. Two of them were sentenced to death, but their lives were saved by the governor. The third is now in the death cell awaiting execution. Since these convictions, now two years old, there has not been another axe murder. That's just a lie. A total lie. Because they were still going on. There was another, like, 20 attacks. So were there ramifications for his actions? No, of course not. Oh, of course not. The criminality and justice system in Birmingham in the 1920s just was a case of personal priority and prejudices rather than any constitutional correctness, or guilt, or innocence. And it's something that we still see today. So after Pearl's arrest, there were no more? They never found the actual murder? We'll never know. They, to my understanding, they didn't ever really go after anybody else, really. Because there were no more murders. No, there still were. They're just- No, no, I'm being the police officer. Oh. <laughs> there were other convictions, but it was highly hidden away. And after 1926, there just really wasn't much following. There weren't many convictions. There wasn't anything going on. Everything was very hidden. The press was done with it. And the police department was especially done with it. They just wanted everything to be fine. Well, that was definitely an insightful look into the world of 1920s Alabama. <laughs> This has been Mistreatments and Miracles, stories from 1920s Alabama. Thank you for listening to this episode.